Uh, for a Gentile, he does more going into the Hebrew than most people do. I hate the NIV with all my heart. Uh, unless you specifically say King James. And I love the Greek and the Hebrew too. And the third day, he rose again. So he didn't need a third night, in other words. You don't need 72 hours for this to work. He's not going by Gentile time. He's going by Jewish time. And they do things totally different anyhow. Um, anyhow, that's another discussion for another day. But I'm just trying to see if there's anything else here. This one is the gospel. And he rose again the third day. If they meant the fourth day, so after a third day and a third night, then they'd say on the fourth day. And then you wouldn't have the gospel. You'd have something weird. You'd be like, what, the fourth day? So anyhow, that's just one of my little sticking points. And it's there today. And it washes the vilest sinner clean, the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's like Jesus Christ is our priest. Um, nine, where did they say that? Nine, nine, twelve, I think it was. But he's taking it for a wooden literal and not understanding the typology that's fulfilled in it. Anyhow, um, so yeah, we, we put a whole commentary, a professional commentary in the very last video that dealt with that. And no, he actually didn't go into heaven with his blood and go, here you go. <laughs> He is the mercy seat. Much more could be said about that. But let's let's move on. This is this is where Robert keeps me sharp because he'll be so good on something and then he'll woo fly off over on some weird tangent. And I'm like, what? So he keeps me fresh. Christ went up to heaven and said, here it is, God, the blood that saves the whole world. And he waved it like a wave offering to the world. No. No. The people waved the grain as the grain offering to God, and then Jesus just fulfilled it. Jesus didn't. Oh, Jesus didn't actually wave his blood around in heaven. Just no, Robert. No, stop that, Robert. Um, by the way, the agriculture is a type for the people. So when Jesus did the cross pose of submission that in essence kind of metaphorically was the wave offering really uh the death the burial the resurrection and those three actually go together and they go in order and they're really important and then too i guess you might say when he came out of the tomb because you know uh, dead people don't move but he's not a normal person. He's God and he's the last Adam and he's the wave offering of the first fruits. So about as wooden literal as you can go when he got out of the tomb and walked out having beat death in a new body, he's walking around as the wave offering. He does not go up to heaven and whip his blood around. That's just weird. He is just saying weirdness on that part. World. And it's all right there. Jesus Christ, the first fruits. Man, I'm getting goosebumps. You can't make this stuff up. This was all prophesied in scriptures. So you have those three things taking place. Jesus Christ was a type in the Old Testament of the Passover, and Jesus Christ came and fulfilled that feast. He was the Passover lamb. Jesus Christ is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is the bread. And so he fulfilled that, that feast. Jesus Christ is called the first fruits. And that's what Jesus is. Yes. Now, as we read through the Bible, we find out there was a feast called the Feast of Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, and verse 1, 
I'm actually, I'm so far behind, I won't even read it. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, you can look it up. It says, you know, the, and when the day of Pentecost cost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And so Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit came down. And guess what? There was a, a body being built by Jesus Christ, which is called the body of Christ. And I'm not going to go into that now. But that feast has been fulfilled by, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down like on Pentecost. And Pentecost was a time when you remembered, and it's called a holy convocation mm -hmm. in Leviticus 23, 24. Mm -hmm. uh, well, excuse me, I'm on the next one. So Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost. All right. So now let's go to the next one, the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. No, because you're going Now here's too something fast. I'm just going to throw out there as you're looking for Leviticus 23. No, you're going too fast. Let's listen to the Bible Project. Who has a weird view about hell? So we've done videos about that. But this one is fine. The Holy Spirit. Is energy. Energy, how so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. ruach. Okay. Ruach now take a big cash. breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply. That too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. Whoa, back it up. Whoa. Uh, the, fir oh, the first person in the Bible who had the Ruach, come on, come on. The first person who had the Ruach was our father, Adam. Remember when God, remember when God blew into Adam? Hold on. Made from the dust. There's a whole thing there. I'm not going to have time to get into, but it's, it's so good. Look, the first man was made out of the dust of the earth, which is talked about in 1 Corinthians 15:47. And the first man was, look, this is so important. Churches are not telling you this. Even the paratroop, para, not paratroop, parachurches are not telling you this. When God made Adam, he made a body, right? Everybody got that part. Everybody knows that part. He gave him a soul. So a soma and a psyche, right? He also gave him a spirit and within connected to and bonded into his spirit was the holy spirit we've done so many videos talking about that jesus says be born again and you're like what does that mean if you need to get the holy spirit back in your temple it assumes that it's not there he's not there right that makes sense so when you back it up to genesis it only makes sense that when the Holy Spirit and, and Yahweh are creating Adam, he breathes into him the breath of life, and you get this triad, which is also seen in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. So I'm not making it up. It's in Scripture. So it's a big mistake to say that, you know, only Joseph... <laughs> so far down the line away from Adam had the Ruach and had dreams. Although that's certainly true. But if you miss that first part in, in, in the garden and then the Holy spirit upon the sin of the fruit of disobedience leaves the bodies of Adam and Eve, why do you think they realize they're naked? They ha so God is a light among many other things. And the light is inside of them, right? And they're walking with God in the cool of the day. They have the Holy Spirit inside of them. And everything is just awesome because it's blessed. He tells them, don't eat the fruit. They totally eat the fruit. 
they get kicked out of the garden and that's it, right? That's all that happens. That's all church ever tells you about. And then Jesus pops up thousands of years later and goes, you need to be born again. And then we all walk around scratching our head going, what does that mean? Like practically, what does that mean? The only thing that makes sense is that Adam had a spirit, his spirit man inside him, and that died, which is the whole reason why you need the Holy Spirit to go back inside your temple. Pentecost is getting the Holy Spirit, what? Back in your temple. And that very first beautiful occasion, Shabbat, where that 120, they were the first, right? And then everybody remembers Paul, uh, Peter's, excuse me, I'm sorry, Peter's beautiful speech and history lesson. We also got a history lesson from Stephen, too, a little bit later on. But 3,000 people, bam, saved, just like that. What must we do to be saved? We totally screwed up. We killed our own Messiah. This is not good, right? So these things have to do with the correction of the Ichabod, the correction of getting the Holy Spirit back in your temple. We must not overlook these things. They're important. And then it happens to this guy named Betzalel, and he's an artist. God's spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and yeah. said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after... Okay, wait, back it up. Remember? First Adam. God breathed into him and made him a living soul. He would have given him the rock in his temple, body, soul, spirit, right there. Now you have last Adam doing the same thing. You have to see these things in parallels to in, in order to understand what we're, what God is doing and where it all comes from. Um, so he blows on his friends and says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing. What happened in Genesis is what's happening now in Shabbat. This is really important. And um, obviously Eve came from Adam's rib. I don't want to leave her out of the story. But when we talk about man, we're talking about mankind. So, you know, it all goes together. After that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. One, I would also say that you are literally a completely brand new creation. It's not some kind of, you know, Christian poster that you put on your wall and you work yourself up to it. Like, I am a new creation. I can do this. I can choose to not sit. That's not what it is. Although you will walk and wrestle in your sanctification. You will. But you literally have God living on the inside of you. It's just that these eyes don't pick up a lot of things. So he's literally on the inside. And now when you have that new spirit imparted to you that he's resurrected or the King James calls it quickens your spirit, makes it alive. You know, the Apostles Creed, I believe it is. It's a, you know, he'll judge the quick and the dead. I always wonder what the heck that meant when I was a kid. What is the quick? Um, but anyhow, this is about the Holy Spirit going inside you and resuscitating your spirit man. Guess what? When your spirit man comes alive and it's hungry, do you know what it eats? The word of God that's meat and milk. That's what's going on with Shabbat, and it's been happening for 
ever since then, every time somebody gets born again, you're added into the family, added into the family, added into the family. <laughs> this stuff is important stuff, much more than the church is telling you by ignoring the feasts. It really is important.